And we're going to continue in our series called Streams of Living Water. Today we get to look at the evangelical stream of the church. I'm excited to do that with you. You know, this really is a series. It's not an episode, right? So we're trying to build as we go on uh, this conversation about the streams of the church. And I do think there's things that come out when we get to hear all of them. It's okay if you miss some of them or if you're just joining us, welcome. I'm hoping you'll get something good out of the sermon this morning. Uh, but also we're just filling things in as we go through this, this series, as we talk about these really beautiful and important streams uh, that come out of our, our, our Bibles and out of the church and out of the work of the Spirit even now in our midst. Um, so let's talk about the evangelical stream of the church. And one of the ways we're going to begin to do that in seeking a biblical definition is to talk about the subheading that Richard Foster uses in his book, which we're basing our sermon series off of, where he speaks of the evangelical tradition as a word-centered life. And as Dave just uh, showed us, this, this has a double meaning for us, right? when we speak about a word-centered life, because probably the first thing we think about, we talk about the word is our Bibles. Um, but also when Jesus preached that first sermon and said that the scripture is fulfilled, he's speaking about himself, right? So that means that as John in the gospel, at the beginning of the gospel of John says, he is the embodied word. And so we go to our scriptures in order to find Jesus, ultimately, as the good news. So let's talk a little bit about Scripture first, and we'll get to uh, how that points us to Jesus. I, I love the Scripture, and that makes me evangelical. Um, I find that uh, it is asking the questions that my heart asks. And I wonder if you're the same way. The questions are, what does it mean to be human? What is a human being? What is wrong with human beings? I don't know if you've ever felt that one before. I remember once, one time I was in the kitchen complaining uh, about what's wrong with human beings and talking about it and, and from a Christian perspective when my aunt from across the room who had studied a lot of philosophy said, well, human beings aren't bad. And I was just shocked by that. I was shocked because my experience said, no, yeah, they are bad. Uh, they're doing bad stuff in the world. Um, but it's, it's an interesting thing to talk about, right? What's wrong with human beings? Is there something wrong with them? Are they good to go? Um, what are we exploring inside of us? And then ultimately, if there are things that are wrong with human beings, what's going to put them right? And, and those are the questions that the church and the scriptures ask. So they invite us to ask those questions and to wrestle with those questions. One of the things in my seminary training that I just loved as they talked about, you know, what it means to study the Bible and what it means to be a pastor is to be the keeper of the sacred questions. That as people of faith, we are the keeper of the sacred questions. And we ask them in every season of our life. And we need to ask them time and time again. And we need to define them. And if we do or we don't, if we're conscious of our answers to those questions or unconscious of them, if we're active or reactive in them, that will cause us to make different choices in our life, right? And ultimately create a path for our life. And so how we answer and define these questions determines so much about how we live uh, and what we do with our time here on earth. And so they're really important questions. And so having a word-centered life means that the way in which we decide to look at the answers to those questions ultimately is to look to the scripture. And the thing about the scripture is there's this wealth of knowledge that is passed down that is tried and true. And I like it because it 
is confusing and messy and it's surprising and interesting and life-giving and it's all of those things. And so it never stops being interesting because it continues to reveal itself, not because something's wrong with it, but because there's things wrong with me that I still need to learn and to understand about it. Um, and to grow in what it's actually trying to say and reveal. And so that's why we come. We come to ask the question, what does it mean to be human? Or you could say, what does it mean to be fill in your name? And I find that there's so many people out there that um, are living in a story that they don't know they're living in. And it becomes really challenging because they don't have working answers or definitions to these questions. And so when the rubber hits the road, where do they go? What do they do? Who do they talk to? And what answers do those people give them about how they're supposed to live and what they're supposed to do and the choices that they're supposed to make? And so one of the burdens of the evangelist, one of the burdens of the gift of wanting to give the good news to people is to say, man, I just want to see people understand the story that they're living in so that they can live their best possible life. I have seen people that I admire and respect give their life for the sake of this cause. And it has been truly inspirational to me. Um, Todd Grant, many of you know, uh, at Watts Powerhouse Church, um, down in Watts, is kind of like a sister church of ours, um, unfortunately and devastatingly lost his wife uh, uh, about a year or so ago. And he preached this sermon at his funeral, at her funeral, And one of the things that came out of that time was this powerful witness and testimony of a life given to bring the good news, to shine light in the darkness. And it was Todd's heart's cry, even at his wife's memorial, that by her life, Others would come to know who Jesus is. God, it was a powerful testimony to me, and there was an unintended altar call at the end of that memorial service where people just came up and they said, I want to, in light of Jen's life and what she did for me, I want to dedicate myself to my faith and knowing Jesus and coming to church. It was powerful to witness. You could feel the presence of God in that small auditorium in this school in Watts, Los Angeles, as the light broke forth out of the darkness and people responded. And so those experiences to me shape how I think about the good news of the gospel. And I find that people do ask them in these places, these in-between places, you know, when things are changing in their life, all of a sudden we're asking the questions again, right? For getting married, we probably need having a kid. We ask these questions again. We go, okay, like, how am I going to raise my kids? How am I going to do marriage? What are we building on? What is it that we're striving for? And who shows us the way through these times and seasons of our lives? Because we know there's challenges to those seasons, right? Or ultimately, where pastors really develop a burden is in memorials. Because the final question is asked at the memorial. And you're asked to be in somebody's life, and maybe you didn't know them until the end, and you're scrambling to get to know and understand them as they ask these profound questions right at the end and to help them to find that final definition. All of this is so that people would know, whenever they come to know, the good news of the gospel. 
And I want to read to you a scripture that demonstrates how scripture would answer the question, what does it mean to be human? What is wrong with human beings? And can it be made right? It's from 1 Peter chapter 2. It says this, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed for you are like sheep going astray but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls you know meeting here always brings fun stories uh, and unique stories in the life of the church one last week happened Ginny Nino, I don't know if she's here today maybe she is I can't uh, oh yeah there she is um I mean, excuse me, Jenny Valentini, Jenny Valentini, <laughs> excuse me, got, got confused. She lives right across the street over here uh, next to the church. And so after church last week, she came up to me and she said, I saw one of my neighbors. And as many of you at the service, and as many of you know, uh, this is kind of like a public space for the neighbors around her, right? They walk their dogs around and they, they come through the service. We even had a guy, I don't know if you saw on Easter, that was walking his dog and then he just parked it and his dog parked it there with him for a little while to hear the good news of the gospel, which I loved. Um, but last week she was talking to her neighbor who was just walking by and kind of seeing things out of the corner of his eye. And he asked, he said, wait, this is so cool. Do you guys do this every week? And she said, yeah, yeah, we do this every week. And they said, so, so I can just ask somebody to come and they can come whenever they want to come. And she said, yeah, well, how long have you been doing it? Oh, we've been doing it for over a year now outside. Isn't that so great? And so he said, okay, so if anybody needs a shot, they can come to the parking lot and they can come get a shot. And she's like, well, kind of. But if we think about what's being said in the scripture from 1 Peter here, we see it says, by his wounds you have been healed, right? And we're talking not about um, our physical health, although if you look at every symbol for hospitals that is popular, they all are marked by this gospel symbol. You may have seen ones that have a cross and a snake on it. That harkens all the way back to the Old Testament where uh, it's this interesting story where a snake is lifted up, but people look upon it and are healed. And then that's used in the Gospel of John to, as a precursor to the cross where Jesus is lifted up and all who look upon him will be healed. Or, of course, just the, the sign of the cross as a sign of health and life. By his wounds we are healed is an answer to the question, does God care? Is there something wrong with us that God wants to address and you know, just like the vaccine, although I know there's different questions out there about the vaccine, ultimately... When it comes to our souls, this is what we're doing. We're inviting people to come and to be healed. That's a shareable message. Come and discover the story that you are living in. Come and be healed. Come and discover that Jesus Christ was sent to this earth to take on all of your mistakes, all of your history, and to say no more to failure and horror and anxiety and to become a completely new creation in light of what he has done, taking on our sin on the cross. And that we could be returned back to the true shepherd and overseer of our lives who cares for us. And I want you to think about that. I want you to think about 
Who are the people in your life that need this message? And how are we telling the story? You know, I can still remember the staff meeting and, and eventually the announcement here that Peter T's wife is pregnant and he's gonna have his first child, yeah. It gets clapped again, Pete, see, exactly. But there's this feeling every parent knows, right? When you first realize, oh my goodness, everything's about to change. And of course you keep it a secret for a little while, waiting for things to develop. But then you have this imminently shareable news. And you know, people start fires. I don't know, you saw that, right? When they did that birth announcement, they start a fire to declare, I'm having a boy. I'm having a girl. They do these extravagant things in order to share this news, the shareable news. And in a way, I think what we need to do is to connect to our first love, right? And in connecting to our first love, we discover again how shareable this good news really is. And the things that we might do to be creative, to apply ourselves, to understand that there are poor ways of telling a story and there are good ways of telling a story. And to really think about that, to really think about what are the good ways to tell the good news in the culture we live in, in our time and space. You know, often when we encounter evangelical, we have conceptions in our mind, you know. Like I was driving by Costco the other day and there's a guy out there with a megaphone and he's just yelling at me to repent. And I want to stop and say, I am a pastor. I got that part. He's kind of casting a wide net here. Or the ways in which a lot of times when we're trying to shape the message what we're doing is actually trying to get people to behave the way that we want them to behave before they meet Jesus. And the thing about Jesus is when anybody comes to him like the Pharisees and says, Jesus, this person isn't behaving the way that they should behave, he says his prayer of his heart is that eyes would see and that ears would hear, right? When the disciples are like, why aren't they getting it? He's like, well, they haven't come alive to the message yet. They haven't seen the kingdom yet. So quit blaming the dark for being dark and shine a light, right? Quit asking for the culture to come to the church before they know Jesus Christ. Our job, then we're cutting corners, right? Because what we need to be doing is in going out and encouraging and showing people the gospel and living the gospel and shining the light. And then we can talk about how people should behave and what they should be doing. We can help people through community to live into the sanctification of what it means to follow Jesus because they need the power of Jesus. They need to be connected to that before we get into this holiness conversation, right? One of the best evangelists ever, I think I will have no debate here, Billy Graham. Anybody go to a Billy Graham crusade? Show me your hand, that's right. You've been there, you know. I don't know if there's anybody who's defined the evangelical movement uh, more than him for us um, in recent history. And I just want to take a, a, a few teachings and moments from Billy Graham's life so that we could learn through him what great evangelism looks like and how it works nicely with what we're talking about here in the streams of living water. So let's talk about prayer, which was our first dream, the contemplative stream. One of the things Billy Graham said is that heaven is full of answers to prayers for which no one ever bothered to ask. 
Sounds like an evangelist, doesn't it? Sounds like somebody who put himself at risk for the sake of the gospel and discovered that when he asked for things that God was willing to answer. And he really believed in prayer, right? He, he didn't just go out and say, okay, I'm going to start doing stuff. He said, first, I'm going to ask God that he would make me able to have these conversations and to love these people into the kingdom. And then holiness, this is a famous story. You probably know this as we talked about the holiness stream that as Billy Graham uh, rose to prominence as a preacher and he became the guy, the heir apparent to these outdoor revivals that were going on, he started to get a sense of what it meant to be in such a powerful position and the temptations that can come from that. And so he got his team together and he had them analyze different things that had taken the other leaders of these movements out. And of course, they discussed the big three, right? Money, sex, and power. And how the evil one would want to take out any leader that is bringing so many people to faith because then all of that work would be diminished. And so he got his team together and he created all of these measures of accountability. And he created famous rules like the Billy Graham rule, which is like he never met with a woman one-on-one -on -one in his whole time. He had all kinds of accountability on money and power. And the reason for that is because he wanted as many people as possible to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And so he patterned his life in a way where he would live a holy life with accountability, making mistakes, but repenting for those mistakes. And of course, when you look at the charismatic tradition about the Holy Spirit, he wrote book, the book on the Holy Spirit. The power of God was his message. And so you can still read that book, an incredible book on the power of God through the Holy Spirit. Then we look at the justice stream. I don't know if you are aware of this history, but Billy Graham preached through the civil rights era. And one of the things that he did in his time was repent of the sin of racism. He did that in, uh, in the South, in the segregated South, because he, for a time, was conducting open-air revivals, and he had segregation going on within his revival, which was the law of the time in the South. But eventually he realized that this was a terrible thing, and so, famously, in one of his big open-air revivals, he walked down the aisle where the dividing line was. He tore down the dividing line, and he said he would never, ever again preach to a segregated audience. This became particularly powerful because also in this era was the apartheid in South Africa. And so he refused to preach and do revivals in South Africa unless they could have... Uh, multicultural audience. So for many years, he didn't come until eventually the very first uh, desegregated thing in apartheid South Africa was a Billy Graham revival. And so he lived deeply into the justice stream of the church. And then we come to the evangelical stream, which I think this, this approach that he took for evangelism is so important for us to pay attention to is really at the heart of what we're doing through this series. Because one of the things that Billy Graham did, his great strategy, they say, for evangelism was the mobilization of the church, of what we call the ecumenical church, meaning that he worked with any pastor in any community that was willing to work with him in order to invite people to revival. So he would put the word out months in advance to all the local churches and pastors, and he would mobilize those churches and pastors to invite friends to the revival. Well, that is a, a strategy of the church built on John chapter 17, where Jesus' prayer is for unity within the church. 
that churches would work together and not see each other as some odd competition with one another, but to actually care for the thriving of all churches. When we drive by and see all these churches, our prayer isn't that we would do better than them. Our prayer is that they would all grow and that we would work together to see revival and kingdom. And many of you know that this worked powerfully. In fact, they count, you know, about 3.2 million people responded to a message from Billy Graham at one of his crusades and came to the front to dedicate their lives to Jesus Christ. And so what can we learn from this? One of the things I think we can learn is that there is power in evangelism. The, co- the cultural conception of evangelism we get all over the place is like, one person or two people knocking on doors or going to speak to people. That, that would be like a fishing with a fishing pole, right? Just one person out there trying to catch some fish. But what Billy Graham was doing was actually called net evangelism, meaning that it was the power of the church working together, just like uh, the disciples, like Peter and, and his crew that were using nets, casting nets in order to bring in a big catch of fish. That the church has this power when it comes together in all of its giftings to work together to bear witness. And so people come to faith in that way as well. So just a couple practical questions because this is a practical thing, you know. Is there somebody in your life that you could be invitational towards? Is there somebody that You know, you could just simply invite them to church, invite them to join you. Could you be conversational? Do you talk about the things that you love? Do you talk about Jesus with the people in your life? Is Jesus important to you? Does he help you to define these things? And if he does, would you have that conversation with people? You know, a lot of us live undercover Christian lives, right? We never really bring our faith to speech. And so there's a way in which we need to learn how to do that. I don't think that it's going to get you into any kind of big trouble. Uh, Most people, uh, when you tell them that this is deeply meaningful to you and you have relationship with them, really see that as an authentic expression of who you are. Um, very rarely are we going to experience persecution for that. And if you are, then I think Jesus says you're blessed. If you're doing that from a beautiful place of prayer and authenticity. And so would you be invitational? Would you invite people? Um, Would you have the conversation? And in that, would you see yourself as a bearer and ambassador of this good news message? that really I believe is the answer when you keep asking the question over and over, why are so many things going wrong? Why are people hurting and suffering? This is a soul problem and it has a soul solution. And Jesus is the one who heals our soul. And so may we turn to him and understand that he has prepared good works in advance for us to do. And like Billy Graham, may we pray that God would do his work through us and just ask God, would you give us, would you give us those people that need to know who you are and what you're about? Lord, we thank you for this uh, tradition. We thank you for the invitation to invite Um, to encourage, to reflect, um, and to see your power manifest. Lord, would you grow us and challenge us and convict us, Lord? And, And not just today, not just because of this sermon, but because you are good and you are worthy to be shared to all who also deserve to come to know how good you are. Your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.